Diane Francis is an award-winning columnist. He's, she's the editor at large at the National Post. She's also a fellow at the Atlantic Institute or Council in Washington, and she's an award-winning author. Um, Diane, welcome. Thank you. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Diane, I'm delighted to have you today as we talk about many things from the state of Canada to the world. And uh, one of the things I'd like to start off with is the, is the state of Canada. Um, I know that you've written extensively about it. Um, we, we know that there's a lot of challenges that Canada faces. What would you summarize as the state of Canada today? Well, I think that it's a, a, a you know, it's a, it's a vibrant economy, a uh, very nice society uh, that does okay, uh, even though it's being run by a coalition of people that don't know anything about governance, business, economics, geopolitics, defense, security, anything. Uh, we have wow. two leaders in tandem who've made a deal that they didn't tell the voters in the last election that they were going to do, and they stay there till 2025 if they choose to. And uh, neither one of them, one got 15% of the popular vote, the other one 30. So mm -hmm. Canada's stuck with a kind of a, I think, a, a inadequate democratic system in terms of how, how the voting can come out. Uh, and, you know, we have very mediocre management. Okay, so that's the punchline. We've got a wonderful country, but managed by a coalition, and it's very mediocre. That's it, is it? Yep, in a nutshell. Okay, okay so in that context, um, we're, I mean, obviously I'm with the Frontier Center for Public Policy, so we're used to a, a world, uh, dare we say, Diane, where we try to look at the pros and cons of an issue. We try to govern or recommend policy that's based on good sound evidence and facts and analysis. So what the heck is our country being governed then by? Well, it's being governed by a prime minister who has this coalition with an NDP leader who's a socialist. Uh, and basically, uh, he's uh, been enacting a very um, Davosian, if you like, uh, to use that phrase. I went to Davos 25 times. It was a great place to go to learn stuff. But I didn't agree with a lot of what they ended up uh, supporting. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, he and his, uh, his uh, team have swallowed whole the Greenpeace agenda, the Davos agenda, the woke agenda, you know, and this is what they do. And, you know, okay. irrespective of, and also have concocted some arbitrary policies, notably the flood of immigration they're allowing in every year that has gone mm -hmm. on since 2015, that is now demonstrably, it's a million people a year, 500,000 immigrants and at least 500,000 foreign students. And the way I like to put it to Canadians, is that that's a million people a year who get a health card and are breaking our health care system and a million people a year who need somewhere to rent or live, which is wow. up prices. And the most important thing is the vast majority of those million go to Toronto and Vancouver. They don't go anywhere else. And so that, that's what is, is, is uh, uh, discombobulating this country to a great extent in the two biggest cities in this country. Yeah, no, it's a very powerful summation. So if we could uh, just dive into this a little bit more then, um, it seems to me like when you say a Davos, Davosonian approach to governance, what, what do you mean by that exactly? So people understand that. Well, I mean, I, I believe it's a, it's a uh, you know, a, uh, a green agenda mm -hmm. uh, based on NGOs that aren't elected by anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a, a uh, -E ESG agenda from Davos by a bunch of guys who get involved there and aren't elected by anybody. As per your, your comments about immigration. 
um, a million people coming in every year is, is a huge number of people um, that uh, places a, a burden on the existing ones. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons, obviously, but that's a, that's a record number. Yeah, it's the highest proportion of any G7 nation. And it's just a disproportionate to our economic growth uh, trajectory. And mm -hmm. it, it's just to clarify, it's a million, it's half a million uh, landed permanent immigrants and half a million students, many of whom come on bogus for bogus reasons and never leave again, then eventually apply to stay permanently. Each of them require a health card, which is why it takes months for people to get an appointment now in Toronto or Vancouver for a specialist to look at your mole on your cheek, for goodness sake. The system is close to breaking, and they're breaking it. So I want to look at uh, some of the, the more detailed um, points around our economy. If we look at gas prices, uh, we know that um, inflation stats just came out for July. I think we're up at around 3.5%. Um, we've got a national debt, if memory serves me correctly, at it's hard to keep these figures straight at $1.1 trillion. Um, we've got record deficits federally and uh, in different provinces. Where's the state of our economy? Because you said it's it's chugging along nicely, but aren't there aren't those ominous clouds? No, I don't think there's anything terribly ominous in that. Uh, basically, look, to be blunt, Canada is an autonomous economic region of the United States. That's what it is. Our trade is intercorporate transfers. We call it trade. We do not. We have, we have great companies. We make good products. We do good services. But at the end of the day, it's up to the Americans and their economy. And we go up and down with them with very little di divergence. And we just don't have a, a entrepreneurial culture of traders. We don't do that. Our idea of trade is to sell something to the Yanks. And so that's uh -huh. great. It's a great living. Uh, the, other, the other problem, which leads into another problem. So what I'm saying is that the, the one exception to the, the fact that we flow with them is that we have a government that's actually uh, putting us faster in debt uh, than, than the Americans are. They're not doing a great job either. But Canada uh -huh. is just you know in a class by itself. So we have the highest consumer debt in the world highest consumer debt that's not because we charge things in our credit card that's because we've been bringing in a million people a year to jam up the housing prices in the two biggest cities and so house prices have doubled and in some cases rents have doubled or tripled so that's wow. where people are getting into debt they just don't have money so they're getting they're buying a house and they're getting into huge mortgages and that's mm -hmm. the underlying cause behind this this is just a poorly managed federal government who don't have a clue. Now, that also flows into another pet peeve of mine, and that is Canada is now embarrassing itself internationally, this government, because we're not pulling our weight in NATO. We're not pulling our weight in NORAD. Okay, so so Diane, you're, you're giving us reality therapy that when we look at our economy, we, we really are kind of a branch plant of the United States. And uh, we're not pulling our weight internationally. So the, the case in point is NATO. Uh, so we, what's the proof of that? We aren't just meeting our GDP percentage allocation towards NATO. Yeah. Every member needs to do, what is it, 2%? 2% we committed. This guy committed, Trudeau, in 2015. Yeah, 2% will make it. And last year he told the Washington Post, we'll never get there. And we're like at 1-1. I mean, it's, it's pretty disgraceful. The bottom line is that we are made secure. We don't have anybody in the Arctic. We have more coastline than any other nation on the planet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have, we have the Navy smaller than Sri Lanka's. We have you no military. They can't recruit people. Nobody wants to work for them. They have been absolutely hollowing out our military. Okay. Which is fine. Why, so what is your theory? Why do you well, think, I they're think not again, I think again it's this this uh, this sort of agenda uh, of uh, this this sort of euro Davos agenda of you know war is a dirty word. We can't ever we can't have guns. We can't do that kind of thing. And and mm -hmm. you know we're, we're we're relying on Big Brother to the south to guard all of our coastlines, our airspace, 
and and that sort of thing. And that's great. But one day they're going to start giving us an invoice. Wow. So, I, I mean, I think that your points about Northern sovereignty are well taken. I mean, if you compare and contrast between, say, how the U.S. has developed Alaska versus, say, the Canadian North, it's pretty stunning difference, isn't it? Well, there you go. Again, this is this uh, Canada. Canada is a different uh, culture anyway. I mean, Canadians are uh, less entrepreneurial uh, by mm -hmm. nature uh, and a little more defer, defer, they pay more deference to governments. They, let gov they, they sort of trust their governments to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have is a, and again, this is Trudeau's uh, problem and it's the religion in, in Quebec and in Ottawa, which is run by Quebec. And that is that, you know, uh, nuclear is bad, um, mm -hmm. military is bad, we're pacifist, and the environment is all important. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's not, that's, that's fine as a value system, but that's not what you, you, uh, you uh, make the government policy without getting a consensus on that. Exactly. So when we look at um, the situation, though, financially, are I mean, this last su this whole summer, interest rates keep creeping up um, with bonds. So, is is our government cornering themselves where we'll get into that uh, situation where because of higher interest rates, we'll have ballooning deficits, and that we're that's a real problem for Canada. Look, we have two trust fund kids, Singh and Trudeau. Okay, little rich boys. Mm -hmm. They've never really ran a business or met a payroll in their lives. Yeah, they've never run anything in their lives. Yeah, Just putting it on daddy's tab. That's right. what they're doing to us. And we're daddy. We're the daddy. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting it on the tab. Deficits are growing. You get the finance minister who's a journalist. She doesn't have any credentials to be a finance minister. Mm -hmm. Okay, or even a bookkeeper. And she gets on there saying everything's just fine. It's fine. We're doing yeah. real well. Well, you know what? That's 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 the little talk amongst themselves that they give you the little pep talks internally and mm -hmm. and i just don't buy it and and i don't think the world buys it so you know canada cannot can, the, and canada continues to do okay because in spite of bad government mm -hmm. you know we've got a great resource base and anybody who denies that we're not based on resources uh, yeah. is living on another planet exactly. and they've also attacked that and they've disrespected western canada Mm -hmm. And, you know, a whole host of other things. I mean, they're just an elitist bunch of pretenders. And by mm -hmm. the way, this is another statistic that really bothers everybody. Not only are they forcing provinces to give away a million health care cards a year that mm -hmm. we can't afford to give away, but this government is spending $17.7 billion, the federal government of Trudeau, $17.7 billion dollars on hiring management consultants because they don't know anything. They don't know what to do. It's it's mm -hmm. a huge expenditure. And by the way, it's nearly half our defense budget. So they're spending wow. nearly half our defense budget to hire guys who tell them what to do because they don't know. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that about uh, the dynamic of ministers being more public faces or symbols of their ministry rather than having any domain or managerial expertise of their area. I think that's that's a great insight. Most of them are environmental activists and political operatives. And that's what's running a G7 economy. I think that's pretty terrible. So can you help us uh, put this whole war on Canadian oil and gas into perspective? It seems like uh, one of our ace cards in our country has been affordable energy, including affordable energy uh, from from Canada, oil and gas, and it's been ethically produced. It's it's really quite in contrast with uh, nasty regimes like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and all Russia. the rest. Uh, Russia is a good example, and yet our our Canadian pension plan, if uh, if I understood this correctly, used a screen one of these environmental social governance screens, ESG screens, uh, and they chose Russian oil and gas to invest in our pension money rather than Canadian oil and gas. This is bizarre. How is this possible? Because it's run by the liberals. It's political. Whoever's there is running. Whoever's making those shots in the CPP has been, you know, nominated by the libs and, and has to uh, go along with whatever. So, 
I, I don't know. It sounds crazy on surface. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason behind it. But I just don't think politics has any business in someone who's 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 empowered to invest my future pension money. OK, I don't like that. And, you know, that's that's the sort of thing. Case de Depot is nothing more than a, a an, an investment arm of the Quebec government. Right. And they, they yeah. finance all kinds of stupid businesses in Quebec that don't make any money and they don't go outside. So they're they're tied to the masks should anything go wrong. I mean, this is just a silly way to run a, a run run an economy. Yeah, exactly. So I did want to shift a little bit more to the international side because you certainly um, uh, have a lot of incisive analysis about that. I do want to talk a little bit about China and the uh, Communist Party of China. There's been a lot of, um, how do we say, uh, huge red flags about the Chinese Communist Party and its involvement in our domestic political scene. It's really quite remarkable, the uh, indicators of, of uh, interference in um, the last several uh, federal elections. In favor, of the, in favor of the liberals. Indeed, yes. So do we need a public inquiry? What's the big holdup? What, what's going on here? That's the problem. It's a deferential population and a mediocre, unethical government in place right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should have had a public commission. But I think there was a bit of one. They, he, he appointed his old buddy, uh, David Johnston, uh, right. You know, who who did a remarkably awful job and said, there's no problem. Just take my word for it. And besides, we can't mm -hmm. talk about it because it's secret. You know, what kind of a cop out is that? Uh, yeah. You know, you have judicial inquiries and you keep it closeted and you, mm -hmm. you get it out and you understand it. But, you know, again, the, the, the little the twins in Ottawa get what they want. And they certainly don't want uh, anything like that to to scar them. And, you know, it's just there's just no. And imagine, look at all the upheaval in the U.S. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Look at the mm -hmm. upheaval in the U.S. over voter counts. Good mm -hmm. Lord. Claims it was stolen from me and litigation. And I mean, it, it goes on endlessly. The the to, all in the name of protecting the sanctity of the vote, and there's not even you know any kind of protests or anything over the fact that it has been admitted mm -hmm. that 16 or 17 writings were stolen by the liberals with the help of Chinese in people. Yeah, in it's Washington. outrageous, and yeah. that cost Aaron O'Toole the prime minister's job. Mm -hmm. Because that wasn't the only interference. Yeah. So to think that. You know, a good chunk of the pop, and he got a greater percentage of the popular vote than than Trudeau did, and mm -hmm. lost. And then this sabotage. I mean, and to do nothing about it, and people aren't up in arms. Well, you get the government you deserve. Well, and I think you're 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 putting your finger on something. We have a wonderful Canadian culture, but boy, there's a side to it that seems to be kind of passive and not engage with getting better government. It's almost like we assume the government, uh, we should trust them completely and just kind of uh, disengage. Is that a fair comment? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, the other game that's afoot that the liberals have perpetuated very, very, uh, very well is the, the old uh, rule that, uh, oh, you want the conservatives? You want to have an America here? Do you want to yeah, be born right. in America? Yes. You know, Diane Francis, she was born mm -hmm. in America. She's probably right. a, a, a Republican. Democrat, by the way. A Canadian conservative is left of the Democrats in the U.S., by the way. Pierre Poilievre, oh, no, he's right wing. Well, that's scary. He took coffee to the convoy. Ooh, wow. MAGA. Wow. <laughs> We're going to get MAGA. And the guys exactly. at every... Possible mm -hmm. opportunity, stoke that. They stoke that. You know, Aaron O'Toole mentioned gun control, and that was blown up out of proportion. And then also right. they control the CBC, mm -hmm. which should be shut down. And, mm -hmm. and you know, most of the you know press is liberal. The Globe and Mail, mm -hmm. the Toronto Star, they're all sellouts to the liberals. So, right. you know, the Canadians aren't getting the good, good information. Um, and, you know, life's okay. So... If we look back at Canada, and, and uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our, our, our very interesting discussion, Dan, 
if we look at Canada, I mean, it's an incredible country as we as we've talked about. Um, we build on a long tradition of of uh, economic success and freedom. Um, how do we get it back on track? How do we um, improve our culture, our, our sense of our history, uh, let alone our economy? Well, you know, we do have, uh, I think uh, culture is a problem. Uh, Trudeau would argue that anything to do with the British culture was bad. Mm -hmm. I would argue that anything to do with the French culture is bad. Mm -hmm. So you have that division that, that the British never, never could fix. And what they did was they gave inordinate power to Quebec to keep them happy and happy and prevent them from leaving. And that mm -hmm. has been sustained. So the result of that is, I kind of look at it this way, Canada has the same problem, only different than the United States. These are both countries that were founded two centuries ago, have bylaws that are out of date, okay, that can never be changed because constitutions are unassailable. And the problem in the United States is they had 12 or 14 Southern states that seceded and should have been left to go. Hmm. Both Southern states are the crucible for all of the ultra right wing racist nonsense, mega stuff in that country. And they keep electing the same guys in Congress. So what I'm saying is that the Southern tail wags the American dog. Hmm. The majority of Americans are like the majority of Canadians, you know, mm -hmm. kind of economic conservative, but social liberal. Canada has the same exact problem. We have the tail is Quebec, statist, environmentalist, left wing, give away the store, you know, resent everybody else, feel superior. And that's the tail that wags the Canadian dog. So the Canadian dog is wagged by a left-wing tail, and the American dog is 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 run by a right-wing tail, hmm. and that's really hard to to that is going to be impossible to ever reconcile unless there's secession, and nobody wants to do that. It's too mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you just have to hope that there's enough shock absorbers, and that you know enlightened people, people that are qualified to run these these countries, are elected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you anticipate a new, let's say, federal government coming into power, is there a series of top recommendations for policy action that you'd recommend? Well, there's a little, well, first of all, you got to stop this, this flood of immigration. It's nuts. You have to clean up the student visa thing, which is filled with fraud. Mm -hmm. Filled with this, there's, there's, organizations in Brampton, Ontario that call themselves private schools to get a little charter and stuff, they're fake. Mm -hmm. And they help get visas for a fee to gangsters in India. I mean, this is known. The crime rate in Brampton is worse than Chicago. So, I mean, this is, this is the kind of mismanagement mm -hmm. uh, that's got to be cracked down on. So immigration has got to be uh, reined in and reinvented so that it does benefit Canadians. And then you, of course, have to take in a certain number of people for humanitarian purposes. That's separate mm -hmm. from immigration. Right. Uh, I think the military is embarrassing. I don't think that, uh, and, and if we want to be listened around the table, and, you know, we're, get, we're losing ground because of these people. Uh, you know, we're, we're now, we're going to be overtaken in a year by South Korea as the 10th biggest economy. South Korea mm -hmm. should be in the G7, not Canada. Right. Canada's falling off the ranking in just mm -hmm. about every metric. And so that should be reversed somehow, wherever it's possible. Well said. So if, if you were to turn to Canadians as citizens in terms of recommendations for action, Diane, are there things that you'd encourage us to do other than to speak up to a representative and give them a call and say, hey, look, this uh, level of immigration is not serving Canadians, as an example. What would you recommend citizens do? Well, I mean, getting more involved would be would be refreshing because they mm -hmm. don't get more involved. I think that people have to uh, really be more economically literate. I think they have to understand that when he comes out with one of these stupid environmental requirements or carbon tax that does nothing to reduce emissions, that it only damages our reputation, our foreign investment inflow, and our economy and jobs. 
And, you know, people have to say, well, wait a minute, what about that? I don't think that, is that really a good idea? So, so they're very, you know, very docile. And so that has to stop. Uh, the other thing is the Canadians are very polite and, you know, they don't want to be seen and, you know, big shaming. There's a society that shames. You know, if you say something about immigration, right away, somebody says she's a racist or he's a racist. Mm -hmm. That's why my crusade about immigration has zeroed in on the fact that it's a million health cards a year, not a million people. And it's a million apartments or houses a year. That's it. And they're ruining our society. And that's got to stop. The numbers don't make sense. And we're not feeling, you know, the need uh, that industry keeps talking about is, is uh, worker skills, skilled trades workers. We're not really getting them. So, you know, I, Canadians are always loath to talk about immigration. The I word, ooh, you know, oh, dear, I'm a bad person, right? And Mr. Singh is up there, you know, pontificating to all of us that, you know, we are bad, bad people who have, you know, hurt and been racist. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, it, it's wow. really, it's it, Canadians have to be tougher minded. And mm -hmm. I think Poilievre is doing a good job. He's trying, it's an uphill climb. Uh, but, you know, I think that we may get a Tory government. Mm -hmm. that, that's my hope. Well, it, it's, uh, I want to thank you so much, Diane, for our conversation today and really challenging us to think as adults about the kind of major challenges and issues that we face, as well as being proud Canadians. And uh, so thank you so much for your work as a columnist around the world and as a uh, best-selling author. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.